Okay, now I'm doing my next set of books. I'm going to start with What I Saw in America by G.K. Chesterton, which is kind of an interesting book. I don't even remember how I found it, if I had uh, put it on my list. I believe I just, you know, saw it in my list of G.K. Chesterton books that I had downloaded a while back. Uh, they were all in public domain. So I just downloaded a whole bunch of them. Uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote a lot of different kinds of things. He was known for his Christian essays. Uh, he had some books on St. Francis of Assisi and Thomas Aquinas. He had uh, books on orthodoxy and her heretics, I think, was one of them. Um, so there's that. He had been known as an essayist over various issues in England in the early 20th century. And he also uh, wrote some very odd fiction. The Father Brown mysteries aren't that odd, but they are a little strange uh, for your normal uh, mystery short stories. And he had a collection of short stories. But he also wrote some very odd novels, like The Man Who Was Thursday and uh, Napoleon of Notting Hill, I think it's called, and uh, Man Alive. They're very, very odd books. Anyway, this one isn't so odd. Uh, what I saw in America is it looks like it was built off of a series of essays that he had written for a British audience when he went on a lecture tour of America. And he did compare himself to Dickens, who had done something similar. And, you know, some of the essays were kind of funny to me. Um, it was Prohibition era America. He had some comments about Prohibition in terms of basically it was a set of laws intended to be imposed on the lower classes, the hoi polloi, and the elite. Of course, we get to keep their champagne and booze and whatnot and not have to worry about it. That should sound familiar. Uh, you will see that a lot of what we consider modern political issues were around 100 plus years ago. So, you know, something to think about. Um, and, and there were issues of women's uh, enfranchisement and, you know, women being able to vote, um, women's suffrage. So kind of interesting. It's a little rushed. It's, it's not a completed work in the way that, say, orthodoxy is. Um, a lot of his essays that were of the time, you're missing a lot of the context. And that's because he was writing for a very specific audience of the time. He wasn't writing for Americans. He was writing for British uh, in this book. So that's something to keep in mind. The next one isn't really a book, How Winston Churchill Changed the World. And you can see this. Um, this was the listing I was able to find on Goodreads. A lot of the lecture sets from the teaching company or the great courses are on Goodreads. And hey, I just book them as I do them. Um, this one was kind of interesting because I have gone through, I don't know how many Winston Churchill biographies, not to mention his own what he's written himself, Winston Churchill. I've read a lot of Winston Churchill's own writings. And yet, even so, with this set of lectures, I actually learned some more about Churchill. And it's not even a very large lecture set. I didn't know a lot about Churchill's experience when he was the Home Secretary. Uh, and and that was earlier on in his political career. So if you're new to Churchill, this is actually a great introduction it's because it's short and it hits all the highlights. It, if you're not quite sure why he's important and it goes beyond World War II, um, if you really want to understand 20th, the first half of the 20th century, um, you need to know Churchill. I mean, he's not the only one you need to know, but you need to know. Um, and even if you're like me and you know a lot about Churchill, you probably still will learn something. Uh, if nothing else, it is concise. Uh, so short stuff and long stuff, both good. So the next one is by an author I really enjoy, who's Jasper Ford. He's a Welsh author. Um, I came to him through his Thursday Next series of books, and I hope he has put that one away 
for good because there's not much more I think he can get out of that. Um, but he has had a few false stars. He's created these new worlds. Jasper Ford is one of those kind of whimsical writers. It's semi-fantastical, semi-sci-fi, lots of humor. Uh, but uh, he's he's kind of had some false starts. So he did Shades of Grey. His timing was unfortunate. Uh, but The Color World, um, I really liked that book. And I was hoping he would do a follow-up on that one. This one, Early Riser, has to do with this kind of winter planet or winter version of Earth, I should say, that people basically have to hibernate in the winter. And then there are certain people who stay awake during the winter to do all sorts of maintenance. And there's some intrigue. Uh, there's kind of a mystery going on in this. This one... I didn't like, as I said, this is not really a favorite of mine from Jasper Ford because it is quite a bit darker, a lot of death and some pretty violent deaths. And the ending didn't seem right to me. Um, it is kind of an interesting world that he built, but I would like to see more of The Color World, which is a different book. Um, so I don't recommend this. If you've never read any Jasper Ford, I actually recommend you read Shades of Grey by him. Um, and uh, he, he's written some other ones. I also like The Big Over Easy. That's a good one. Um, that's a spinoff of his Thursday Next books. But you don't need to know anything about the Thursday Next books to enjoy uh, The Big Over Easy. That's another one I recommend. So The Unexpected Guest, which is an adaptation of a play by Agatha Christie. Charles R. Osborne kind of turned it into a novel. From my own review... It would have worked better as a play. The adapter tried his best, but it doesn't really work as well as Christie's usual novels in that in a novel, she would have put more clues in to get to the final result. Uh, there probably were stage directions in the original play to provide more clues, and there would have been giveaways to those watching a second time, but it's a little different from a novel. There are plot elements that... Agatha Christie reused in other novels, and she did that all the time. Um, but, you know, that's that's my point. She did it all the time. Uh, once you got to know a lot of the tricks she liked to use for her, you could say, non-popular, non-famous novels, uh, she would just keep reusing the same elements. For stuff, for her most famous novels, she usually didn't reuse those elements because you can only get away with that. You know, you can only get away with Murder on the Orient Express once um, and the ABC murders once. Uh, murder of Roger Ackroyd, you can do that once. But some of the other tricks, because they weren't as well known novels, she could use them over and over again. And the last one, this is a weird one The Education of Henry Adams. So I have a list of books. You see, this is a, an an odd mix, an eclectic mix of books. Um, it is my primary entertainment. So I do mix in fiction with nonfiction. And uh, to read my own review, this is one of the strangest audio autobiographies I've ever read. And I've read Ben Franklin's, which is a very strange one too. And that's the funniest one I've read. And it doesn't even make it past like 1764, um, the Ben Franklin one. So the first thing that's off about this autobiography or memoir or whatever you want to call this is that it's written in the third person. Henry Adams refers to himself as Henry Adams in the text, but not only that, he also refers to himself as the historian, the student, and other epithets uh, in referring to himself acting in a particular role at that point in his life. It puts a lot of distance between him and the reader. It, you know, you're, you're kind of getting it as if it were some kind of unbiased outside observer, which it, it's not, obviously. So here's something that I actually had to look up afterwards. He skips about 20 years of his life in this book. This includes the time where he was a Harvard professor, 
when he was married and also his wife's death by suicide, um, the building of his professional reputation, you don't quite get where it comes from because he skips over all that work in the middle and he doesn't talk about it. I actually had to go and look up the details later and you understand where his reputation came from. So the focus of the book is, is the title, His Education. And this is partly why he skips those 20 years. Okay, so part of his complaint, I guess, is early on, he had an education built on 18th and maybe even 17th century lines, which was not suited for his 19th century life, which actually went into the early 20th century. Uh, this book was written, and it wasn't quite written as a book. It was like Samistat. It's not even Samistat. But he wrote the book around 1906. Um, so he had already gotten a few years into the 20th century. And he was complaining that what he had been educated for was totally inappropriate for the 20th century. There are some interesting historical notes that I didn't know the details of. So Henry Adams is, yes, of that Adams family. So his father was Charles Francis Adams, who you probably don't know, and I'll get back to that. His grandfather was John Quincy Adams. Okay, so his great-grandfather was John Adams, who he never met, but he did meet John Quincy Adams, his grandfather, and um, his grandmother. So I didn't realize Henry Adams' father, Charles Francis Adams, was an ambassador to England for uh, the Union during the U.S. Civil War, and he had various maneuverings to try to keep England out of the side. I mean, I knew that there was various diplomatic overtures on the Confederate and Union sides in England to try to get support or prevent support and that kind of thing. Uh, he drops names all over the narrative, assuming you know who they are. They were important. They were famous people back then. They're not now. Um, so you do have to keep looking that up. So the only thing I knew about Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who is a big figure in early in his narrative, is that he had been literally beaten up by a fellow congressman in Congress, in the actual Capitol, in the lead up to the Civil War. Uh, Sumner had been an off and on uh, friend of Henry Adams. And you get to learn more about Sumner. And uh, you, you kind of get to learn a little bit about the death of the Whig Party, which was one of the precursors to the Republican Party, uh, by the way. So this is, it's, it's really good from a variety of perspectives. Excellent book. But it's more of, it helps to have a perspective for something that's over 100 years old some of the names and some of the events you should be somewhat familiar with, but a lot of it will be unusual unless you're a historian and you are very familiar with this period. So what did education prepare him for? What did he have to do? What's hilarious is I mentioned he was a Harvard professor, but he didn't have any of what was considered the appropriate education for a Harvard professor. So that's something to think about. And also you think about who were the people who got into Harvard then? What did they study in Harvard? And what did the people, and I keep saying people, but it's all men, of course, the men who came out of Harvard, what did they do? What were their connections? And what were they expected to do in the 19th century? And why might those people feel like they're getting left behind in the industrializ uh, industrialization of the U.S.? of something that they didn't actually connect to at all. So it's something to think about um, uh, and think about what's going on now. What about your own education? What were you educated for? And how appropriate is it for what you're doing now? Is it at all relevant? Does it connect at all? Uh, I did the audiobook uh, version. Again, it was very good. Um, most of the audiobooks I listen to that, and I'm going to recommend, they're excellent audiobook versions because I usually get Tantor audio or Blackstone audio, and those are almost uniformly high quality audiobooks. So, see y'all.